I'm starting to um, to record, and I will start sharing as well. Now, um, any question about um, um, about the text before before I go back again? I sent you this uh, this one. You you received it. I sent you. I resent the whole course booklet. Have you received it? Have you checked it? Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Yeah, I I deleted the old one and I posted the new one on Moodle. The same thing, and I told you that to look at it. Anyway, so here uh, I think, um, um, as I told you, this uh, this poem uh, or this section uh, here, the first canto, um, as I said. Um, really is um, only a little example of Dante's um, vision. Well, I say Dante's vision, or I um, um, maybe I should go back and say that uh, again the same thing that I was saying that his own version of the events after taking um, the whole idea from Abu Al Al Mari as I said last time. Uh, and here, uh, really, he's giving us, of course, examples, the names of people and the poets and the ideas, the details. Of course, taking it uh, all from his own, if you like, um, uh, background, which is European background. So here, uh, he's talking about, about Virgil to be his guide, to help him, to save him from this uh, trouble and to be his guide in this journey. Like, as I said, Ibn al Qarah uh, with uh, Abu al Ala al Ma'ari's uh, case, uh, he adopted or he spoke or he was, um, you know, addressing Ibn al Qarah uh, most of the time. And here uh, we have Dante addressing Virgil, uh, his own countryman, in the same way the poet. Uh, uh, who was before him. Now art thou that Virgilus and that fountain which spreads abroad so wide a river of speech? I made, um, I made response to him with a bashful forehead. Um, so, um, um, just a second. Just a second, uh, I need to say something here. Sorry for this little interruption. Yeah, uh, you see, well, the cane, the cane, somebody asking, Doctor, in the third question, we are free to say that the text is not worthy to be considered as world literature. Sarah, I, I, I asked, I said this in my last exam, I said this, but I'm not, maybe I'm not, Repeating the same kind of question, Sarah. Hmm? Sarah? Could not be, it may not be the same, it may not be the same kind of question, okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, 
so here um, our um, uh, our man is saying that uh, he's of course exaggerating about Virgil and his great um, achievements and so on. Okay. Um, notice now art thou that Virgilus and that fountain which spreads abroad so wide the river of speech. I made response to him with bashful forehead. Oh, of the other poets, honor and light avail me with a long study and great love that have impelled me to explore thy volume. So really he's, he's exaggerating and he's praising Virgil to say you were the great man, you were the great poet, you were the source, the fountain, it was the source of great achievements. And I think, you know, here I give, um, well, not me, uh, the original translator really here, He's giving, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, as I said, these are not my footnotes. I told you, these are not my footnotes. I copied them from the original where I took this from the net from Longfellow's translation. I told you Henry Woodworth Longfellow did the translation as I showed you last time. And this is, of course, he's saying, of course, he's praising Virgil to be the great uh, man of, influence to all poets in Europe and you know he's praising and exaggerating him about being a great man and a poet and who all poets have learned from him and so on okay so he said I need you I need your help because I have learned from you all the things and now I want you to help me here in this uh, in this situation thou art my master and my author, thou, thou art alone, the one from whom I took the beautiful style that has done honor to me. Behold the beast for which I have turned back. Do you, do thou protect me from her famous sage, for she doth make my veins and pulses tremble. I think it's clear, you know, the way he's saying, I'm terrified by this animal, this she-wolf is going to kill me. I want to help me and to protect me from her. You know, you know, this is his image that he's in hell or he's even in this terrible forest or this hell and being attacked by these animals. And of course, yeah, he's talking about this, you know, the she-wolf. And he said, that's why he's saying from her, you know, the she-wolf. And you famous sage means sage here means absolutely learned, absolutely wise man. I want you to help me because I'm terrified. Thee it behoves to take another road, responded he when he beheld me weeping. If from the savage place thou wouldst escape, because this beast, as thou art criest out, suffers not anyone to pass her way but so doth harass him that she destroys him. As if to say, you know, he's telling to him, don't worry, just take another road and don't worry, that beast will not attack uh, or will only attack those people who are frightened, if, if you like, or terrified by her. As if to say only weak people will be, will be punished or will be uh, terrified by her, will be will be attacked by her so don't don't um, don't um, uh, you know uh, worry about it so take this road and i will i'll help you notice because this beast at which thou criest out suffers not anyone to pass her way but thus harass him that she destroys him you know this is the idea it will only attack those who are terrified by her. So be strong and be courageous. And has a nature so malign and ruthless that never does she glut her greedy will's hunger than before. Many the animals with whom she weds and more, the, more they shall be still until the greyhound comes who shall make her perish in her pain. You know, and he gives more, and again here, 
the uh, the more elaboration and again there is another footnote here you know the greyhound here is uh, again references to uh, reality if you like here in the footnote he mentions people the greyhound is Khan again Grand de la Scala Lord of Verona again you know mentioning names and a friend of Dante of course and Verona is here between if you like some places really if you like um, um, mentioned in real life if you like uh, by Boccaccio I think Boccaccio mentioned this uh, before Dante and Boccaccio as I said here you can see in the Decameron um, Boccaccio um, uh, mentioned this uh, in his uh, book notice speaks of him as one of the most notable and magnificent lords that has been known in Italy since the Emperor Frederick II um, and to him Dante dedicated the Paradiso or the last section or the third section because as you said we have um, Inferno, Purgatorio and Paradiso um, and, and so on so in a way he is showing us his, uh, his uh, references to real life if you like um, about uh, this, um, uh, you know, I think it's mixing, if you like, here between reality and fiction and uh, absolutely dream and, and crazy imagination, really, about, about the poem here. He shall not feel on earth, sorry, sorry, on either earth of Pelf. Again, here, um, if you like, uh, the, the word here, I say it's uh, one of those derogatory phrases to mean money or wealth. He shall not feed on, on either earth or money, but upon wisdom and on love and virtue, twixt Fertello and Fertello shall his nation be. Of that low Italy shall, be, shall he be the savior. Again, he reminds me, or he reminds us of all those names, and I think that's not really important uh, at the moment to know all these names uh, to to follow that. Through every city shall be hunt her down until he shall have driven her back to hell. There from whence envy first let her loose. So he's saying, don't worry, this savage animal, this savage beast will be driven back to hell where it was. And don't worry, you'll be saved from it. It will go back, we'll send, we'll send her back to hell where she was. Again, he's saying envy. Again, he's always comparing and contrasting reality to fiction here, imagination to, to his own dream world, which is really um, unbelievable. Um, let me have something here. Sorry. Again, um, uh, therefore, I think and judge it for thy best. Thou follow me, I'll be thy guide and lead thee hence through the eternal place. Yeah, now he's saying it to him directly. I will be your guide and I will help you. So follow me. I will, I will really lead you in the best way and I will uh, lead you to heaven, to the eternal place. He means here, of course, heaven, meaning paradise. Of course, as I said, you know, Dante is imagining this journey from hell into heaven. I don't know. I mean, this is really, um, you know, this, this is picture about, about how the universe is structured. Where thou shalt hear the desperate lamentations. You know, he's, um, he's uh, giving uh, uh, the details about um, how he's going to go through this and what to hear and what to see and what to follow uh, and so on. Where thou shalt hear the desperate lamentation 
shall see the ancient spirits disconsolable who cry out each one of the second for the second death and thou shalt see those who contended are within the fire because they hope to come whenever it may be to the blessed people it's the same really the same story how again in the story of um, uh, abul ala the same exactly he was uh, meeting all these people and he was asking them how are you going how for example how were you being you know or how have you been saved how come you are here in heaven how come you are here in hell what did you do to be here in hell and what did you to do etc etc so this is what he's saying to him that um he's saying that you'll see a lot of people in hell and you'll see them crying and wanting to come out of hell and also you'll see those people who are in heaven and who are happy to be in heaven and to see what have you know what they really have done and so on to reserve or to deserve this kind of punishment or this kind of reward whether in heaven or in paradise again you know we have to understand the symbolism of this you know it's exactly the same thing again you know because this is the whole thing is imagination by the way the whole thing is poetry you know the whole thing is poetry and the same thing we say about about uh, you know abul ala because ibn al qarih also was a poet abul ala was a poet and the whole thing was a response to him even abu ala maybe was commenting on the whole story of al isra wal mi'raj and as you know um, could be many people really criticized him for maybe commenting or saying uh, something about that for some people this could be this could be not um, not good or could be blasphemous or something but that's nothing to do with us at the moment and that's not the question we are asking at in any way but we're talking about this as a literature text uh, in the same way uh, you know um, what uh, abul ala did and what abul ala, abul ala was revered or looked at because of that and here uh, the same thing really is asking and telling us how the whole thing happened to whom then if thou wishest to ascend to whom then if thou wishest to ascend a soul shall be for that than i more worthy with her at my departure i will lay leave thee so um again here notice uh, this footnote let me see what he is again here um it's talking about her really here is petrus and petrus in in real sense um is one of those in real in real sense uh, she she was his wife and he's referring to her as one of uh, those of course uh, great uh, examples um of love and relationship uh, with his um, with his uh, woman there so uh, as if to say here you know referring to her to whom then if thou wishest to ascend a soul shall be for that then i more worthy with her at my departure i will leave thee because the emperor who resigns above in that i was rebellious to his law wills that through the nun come into his city you know again here um uh, as if to say here virgil was talking i don't know which one is talking about petrus and petrus uh, you know in the real sense is uh, the name is um, revered and taken by dante himself and by Boccaccio, and even the whole name is being revealed. Um, I don't know if um, if uh, uh, I mentioned this before, um, because Boccaccio did the same thing about um, about that. 
um, really in in a really very strange way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I I think uh, we can uh, we can find that if we want to go into details about this to other references, you'll find a lot of a lot of things uh, about this. So he's saying uh, he means here the emperor, that emperor, of course, ref referring really to to heaven and to God, who reigns above, you know, who controls the whole universe. In that, I was rebellious to his law. Wills that through that me none come into his cry. He governs everywhere and there he reigns. There is his city and his lofty throne. Oh, happy he whom thereto he elects. And I to him, poet I thee, entreat by that same God whom thou didst never know, so that I may escape this woe and worse. Thou wouldst conduct me there where thou hast said that I may see the portal of St. Peter and that and those thou makest so disconsolate. Then he moved on and I behind him followed. <laughs> you know, of course, um, you know, we if we believe this, uh, he's um, uh, referring to the whole idea. Uh, again, when he's saying, uh, you know, saying to himself, I, I, the poet, well, both Virgil was a poet and Dante here is a poet. And the mixture, sometimes you feel you can say Virgil speaking or Dante speaking could be, could be really the same thing, no problem. Anyway, really, I'm not going to elaborate more on this because I think that's enough. But just to give you a hint about what Dante really did in world literature, um, he was highly respected in Western culture, highly, uh, really uh, respected, and I don't know if he deserves this. To me, I think he does not. But you see, he was revered and respected and followed and imitated by, by so many, so many big names in, in literature and in poetry and in symbolism, in imagination, and so on. As I said, really, to me, I think he, to be honest, I think he, he is over, I think, overvalued and over maybe um, respected for something that he did not, really for something he did not fully uh, create on his own or, um, you know, by his own. And that's another question. Maybe somebody else would not say the same thing as I'm saying, but never mind, this is me. Um, any question about uh, Dante? Because I want to leave him and uh, move on to another, to another thing. Yeah? Really, the whole poem, if you like, um, it's about really this question of symbolism and the question of salvation and the question of the journey and the whole meaning of purification because the idea of purgation, you know, in, in real, of course, I don't know. I mean, I'm not questioning here things to do with, with religion or something, but the whole idea of hell and purgation and paradise, the whole thing is all well, this journey of purification, of cleansing, um, as I said, is really symbolical. The whole thing is completely allegorical and symbolical to teach us people to be good and to be nice and to be honorable and to behave well and to know that we will be punished. If we don't do well, we will be punished. And really, in a way, in a way, the whole thing is to be, is to be, at the end of the day, is to be good to ourselves, to our neighbors, to our society, to our people, how we behave, and that's the whole thing. That's the most important thing, really. Um, the whole journey is symbolical, is to make people understand and to, to respect themselves first 
and their neighbors second and their families and their children, their relatives, their people, their whatever, to be good people. You know, at the end of the day, that's to me, I think, the symbolism behind the whole thing, this journey from evil, from hell to, to, to paradise, how you will be purified. It is because this journey goes from hell to purgation and then you move to, to, uh, to paradise. Are we saying that everybody, all of us, I don't know, are we going all to go through this journey? Are we going all to be, <laughs> you know, this is a funny question, but, but you see, this is the idea, really. If you take it, of course, the whole thing is symbolical, absolutely symbolical. It has nothing to do with uh, the whether you believe this or not. That's totally different. So that's it about Dante. And I think that's uh, enough. As I said, I will give you another example today. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, the other example, really, I will give today is Ovid. Again, our friend Ovid is, I think he's a much different in texture, absolutely different in texture than uh, than our um, than our friend Dante. Although Ovid, again, the same way, he is uh, he is an Italian. He is an Italian in the same way like Dante. Um, well, the reason really I, I really did not want to give Ovid as an example of because we had um, we had this example by the Italian literature and really because as I told you I wanted to give you uh, the title Metamorphosis um, uh, by Kafka Franz Kafka the German Austrian German, Austrian German writer, a great Austrian, originally Austrian, Austrian uh, German writer. But you see, because of the title Metamorphosis, because the title to me it was, well, not the title, I mean the nature of that uh, story, I thought it was really uh, miserable and uh, maybe terrible to read uh, because it was the story of a man who woke up in the morning to find himself changed into an insect into uh, like a worm and I thought wow oh, oh my god what's this you know um, and then really I um, I changed my mind and I said, no, no, I think people will not be happy with it. Although the, 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 the text, I think the text is being, is being studied and again by Kafka. Kafka is, 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 or was, I should say, really was a great German author, really a great German novelist. He wrote a great, absolutely important, especially you know, um, uh, the, the novel called The Trial, um, and so many uh, other things, especially also, uh, you know, things to do with, uh, with all this materialistic, heavy questions, uh, European questions to do with uh, the, um, well, with politics and materialism and economy and so many really, um, he was so critical, very, very much critical of society. Especially in that story, as I said, the short story. Well, it's a short novella, really. Some people call it a novel, as I said, called Metamorphosis. The man who woke up in the morning to find himself a worm, like a worm, an insect. And he was crawling in his, in his room, and his family did not want to... They couldn't believe it, how they would treat this as their brother and their, you know, I found the whole thing was creepy, really, it's creepy, and I said, 
people will be will be shocked and will be uh, maybe not not happy with it. So anyway, that's why I decided not to give it to you. But I kept the title. I said metamorphosis. I think this is a nice topic. I, let me take another example by the same idea, which is metamorphosis. So I found it from Ovid. Uh, so that's why I, I give Ovid again, only because of the of the topic, not because he's he's Italian. Because I've had enough of Italian from Dante. Dante already is an Italian, and I think we've had enough of him. So Ovid gave us a really a nicer image of metamorphosis. Really, a very lovely, absolutely lovelier uh, image. Oh, let me take these mobiles from here. Yeah, so over the story is very simple. And really here, this is a text translated by, as you can see, by John Dryden. And our friend John Dryden is, is a great poet and dramatist. Really, Samuel Garth, I don't know him. I've not, uh, actually, I've never read him. And I even, I don't know if he was uh, a writer in a real sense, but yeah, John Dryden was a great poet and dramatist. In fact, he wrote a great play, a great tragedy called All for Love. All for Love. It's a great tragedy, really. It's, it's really, it was an, an imitation of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. It's the same story of Romeo and Juliet, but done by, by Dryden. Um, and he called it, as I said, all for love, means they all die for love. The title is, is a lovely title and a play. Actually, I remember we have studied this when I was at university. Maybe I don't know, was second year or first year, I can't remember when we studied this play. I think it was first year when we studied this play in Damascus University. Um, it's a great play, I remember this really a lovely play by John Dryden. So Dryden here is a neoclassical writer. He, neoclassical writer, he died 1700. He died 1700. And he was a great restoration writer. The restoration, um, if you studied in, um, uh, if you are an art student, you studied this in literary, uh, in British survey, the British survey, the restoration period, starting 1660 till 17, uh, 1720, maybe. Uh, he was at the same time writing like Alexander Pope. They were writing mostly in heroic couplets. And Dryden here really did a great job in this translation, really, I must say. So Ovid is an Italian. As you can see here, I give a little, oh, maybe I, um, yeah. Um, Am I sharing this business? Am I sharing this? Yeah, I've not shared. Yeah, let me share it with you. Yeah, okay, you, you can see my screen now? Yes, doctor. Um, <clears throat> Well, again here I say Ovid, as you can see, he was well ahead of uh, Dante. In fact, he, you can see he was born right in the middle, or the, um, you know, he lived just 43 years before or BC and died 17 AD. Um, and no Domine, which is after Christ. So you can see he was. Uh, um, he was much older than Dante or anybody. Ovid was, I think, was, um, I don't know, for many people, again, people think that he was more powerful than, than anybody else. 
I don't know. I mean, this is this is something that people have to judge, and that's not really my 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 business at the moment about whether whether or not he was. So I'm saying Ovid's uh, poetry was enormously popular in the first century Rome and has been an important influence on European poetry from the Renaissance to the present. Ovid has indeed inspired such people as, or poets or uh, uh, authors as Dante Alighieri, Giovanni Boccaccio, Geoffrey Chaucer, and William Shakespeare. Well, again, I, I, I um, took these notes quickly from the um, from references on the net, just to give a little brief idea about who Ovid really, who um, you know, uh, was he, if you like. The Metamorphosis and Faste provided abundant material to Degas. The poetry there has employed brilliant rhetoric concealment and discreet irony. Throughout his poetry, Ovid wrote to please. Um, yeah, I think this is nice, you know, to say that uh, he's writing poetry for, for pleasure. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? But I think that's true. It is true. Um, people write, uh, mostly write poetry for pleasure and for, for, for ideas. But mostly I think poetry is for, for entertainment really. So Ovid did this a lot. Um, and here I give uh, examples again of those um, there. Um, so uh, he wrote, as you can see, I, um, I give examples uh, about the remedies or the art of love or, again, the remedy of love and so on. So the metamorphosis is uh, a fine, nice example here I mentioned, notice. The metamorphosis were some 250 interwoven stories. What? 250? My God, 250 stories uh, written in the epic hexameter. Epics normally are written in dactylic meter. One stress syllables followed by two unstressed syllables. And uh, here, of course, um, you know, he's uh, talking about this, uh, if you like, um, about um, what, uh, if you like, most of this poetry. Uh, was done here, uh, if you like, mostly in these um, in these areas around, um, well, in the Mediterranean, like in Greece and Italy, and and going to Constantinople and er areas like that, the Black Sea and the uh, Tristia and and you know all that. So, um, if you like here. Uh, this is really an interesting uh, example. And I chose for you this little example here, really, about, about Daphne, how Daphne was changed into a tree instead of um, Kafka. Instead of Kafka uh, changing a man into a worm, I didn't like it. So I like this one, a young lady or a young goddess or a lovely goddess changing to a tree, I think is, is much nicer and much uh, more, I think, um, I don't know. I, I, I found it more suitable to, or maybe more interesting to, to see and to read about. And to, to think of the word laurel, because changed into a laurel tree. And you know laurel, I will show you uh, maybe next time about uh, what is uh, the whole idea of Laurel. And here I, I gave you also um, pictures of this, uh, about, uh, about that. This has been um, a lot of, of those sculptures made, really lovely marble sculptures, sculptures made um, about uh, Apollo here, Apollo 
uh, the god Apollo with the goddess here, um, if you like, uh, Daphne or something like Diana or something. So if you believe this, this is really, again, to do with the mythological. Remember, Ovid is writing before, well, mostly his beliefs and ideas in the Roman mythology, in the Greek-Roman, really Greco-Roman mythology. And, you know, in mythology, they believe in the multiplicity of gods, that there are gods and so on. But again, you know, this is literature and this is mythology and this is poetry. It's nothing to do with reality uh, in any way. But of course, can be can be related to reality. If you want, you can shed some of it into reality. I think it can be it can be true. So notice here, I, I gave you this first image here, Apollo and Daphne, a marble sculpture made 1622 by Bernini, you know, one of those Italian sculptures inspired by Ovid's Metamorphosis. Here it's done in, in Rome, depicting the initial stage of Daphne's transformation, how her fingers shone as branches of laurel and her toes taking root into the ground. You know, this is really an amazing, uh, if you like, sculpture. And this is a real sculpture. It's, uh, it's shown there in Rome. How, uh, you know, the idea that uh, uh, Apollo was chasing, chasing uh, Daphne, the minute he reached her, the minute he touched her, she became, uh, she was changed into a tree, or she asked to be changed into a tree by her father, the, uh, the god of uh, river or river god, because she wanted to protect herself and she wants to keep herself always uh, untouchable and virgin and never to be touched. Well, this is. Uh, I, a story, uh, again, one of those really amazing love stories, if you like, and you say, come on, <laughs> well, this is mythology, you know, this is mythology, and I think it can be seen, <laughs> you know, we can say, I can ask ourselves, well, 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 how many men, how many men, or how many people, if you like, fell in love with other people without the other ones knowing about that love. If you love somebody and, you know, and the idea that you can't get them, you know, this is the problem, of course. Really, the, the question here is, is sometimes possible to ask in reality, sometimes people, um, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, there are wars, by the way. There are wars which, well, I think there are, I should say, there were wars which started because of, uh, because of a woman. Hmm? Do you agree with me, girls? You are not listening. You no comments. No comments. Mm -hmm. So really, this is the idea here. We can see the transformation of Daphne into a laurel. Laurel, as I told you, in in. Uh, um, let me let me let me Google the name laurel and show you.
let me I'm just I'm just uh, trying to show you because uh, many times Yeah, can you see my image now? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. So this is uh, yes, the yes. bale. Yeah, this is the laurel tree. Okay. This is this is the laurel tree. In fact, and this is sometimes how they use it like that. In, in fact, uh, you can find it even in um, today. You can find it in. In in places, uh, let me let me find. Uh, <clears throat> let, sorry, let me find. Um, there is another. Um, really um Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just. Yeah, I want to show you this one because really this one here is, is, um, yeah, just a second. I want to share this because I want to show you because I we have this in Syria. Really, it's a lovely, I have one in my own, in my own, in my own um, um, garden in Syria. Can you see the picture here? Yes. Now yes. look at look at it here. Let me show you this clearly. Okay. Um, this one here. You see, it has no. It has uh, berries like uh, really small. I don't know. Do you see the blackberries on it, like uh, like olive uh, here? I don't know. Do you see it? Yes, doctor. Yeah, here you can see the black, really the black berries on it, and um, they use it. They use this uh, like um, like olive, and they actually you can see here. They actually make, um, look at it, look at this one here. Kathy, look at it. Can you see? It's like, it's like olive. Hmm? And they make oil, they make oil with this, and they mix it with, with the olive oil to make soap. Soap, or like shampoo really amazing thing and we use it back home in syria we make it in fact my own brother does this it's 
very, very, very healthy. And I have it here with me here. I use it myself. I never use any shampoo, never. I use this with the olive oil. Have you ever seen this? No. Yeah, this is a Mediterranean tree. It's called laurel. In Arabic, we say algar. Shajar. Uh, doctor. Yeah. Warak algar, doctor. Isn't. Yeah, absolutely. Warak algar. Familiar with it. Yeah, warak algar. Mawjuda bi Carrefour. استخدموها مع الطبخ. No, بتروح زنخة اللحمة والفروج واللحمة. We see the leaves of of it, but we don't see distinct things. Exactly, that's the original thing. That's the real thing. I this is this is look at it. Look 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 at the lovely. Look at that. Can you see it? You see all this. We have this uh, back home in Syria. Really, look at that. It's lovely. Um, as I said, look at this. It's so nice. It's like cherry, isn't it? This is one. It's uh, it's ready to to be to be uh, you know picked. And really, it's an amazing thing. And it became symbolical for it became symbolical for for cleanliness and honor and beauty and and all that which it is really a lovely thing i can't believe it how how it's so nice it's uh, a wild kind of tree it's natural you can't plant it it comes out in nature automatically now you can see here some 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 trees in California and in America, they have different different laurel tree. But originally, it's a Mediterranean tree. It is Mediterranean tree, really. Um, yeah, so that's enough uh, about this. But we, you see, what I want to say that this tree became a symbol of honor and beauty and cleanliness. And it used to, they use it as, they use it for like crowns, like crowns. Tara saying is, is called al -Basus? I don't know. I don't know if it's called al -Basus here. Uh, really, it's, no, I don't think it's al -Basus. No. It's, no, no, uh, no. I thought that one. No, no, no. When you were... When you were asking about if uh, there is some was caused by women. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah, Had al Basus. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Sarah. Okay, good. Yeah, I forgot uh, about that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, really, um, uh, here in the story that this young lady, Daphne, uh, changed into a laurel, which is really a very um, funny thing. And here, the story, I give a footnote at the end uh, about Daphne. You can see it, and this is how we pronounce it. We say Daphne. Look at it. Daphne in Greek meaning laurel. A minor figure in Greek mythology. Again, is a naiad or a variety of female nymph associated with fountains, wells, springs, streams, brooks, and other bodies of fresh water. She is said to be the daughter of a river god, Penis, or Penis, of Thessaly. So her father is supposed to be a river god, and he's called Penis, of Thessaly, and the nymph, uh, Croesa. Also, again, or the god Laden, again, the river Laden of Arcadia. Never mind, don't, don't worry about the names. These are, or there are several versions of the story or the myth in which she appears, 
but the general narrative appears in Greco-Roman mythology. This is what I was saying, this Greco-Roman mythology is that due to a curse made by the god Cupid, son of Venus, or the god Apollo or Phoebus. So the story is um, Cupid, Cupid, the son of Venus, or who is the god of Cupid, or the god of love, who shoots people with arrows of love, you know, uh, was angry with Apollo because Apollo accused him of something. L notice here. So here, uh, as if to say, gods are punishing each other, which is really, again, crazy. She became the unwilling object of Apollo's infatuation, who chased her against her wishes. Just before being overtaken by him, Daphne pleaded with her father or to her river um, godfather for help, who transformed her into a laurel tree, thus defeating Apollo. You know, if you believe that. Henceforth, Apollo developed a special reverence for laurel. So that's why, you know, Laurel it became so great because it originally means it was Daphne, this lovely, beautiful goddess. Okay. So at the Ephesian Games, which were held every four years in, Daph in Delphi, in honor of Apollo, a wreath of laurel gathered from the Vale of Tempe in Sicily was given as a prize. Hence, it later became customary to award prizes in the form of laurel wreaths into victorious generals, athletes, poets, and musicians, etc., etc. So they use it as a like a wreath, or as I say, like a crown. As as the pictures I showed you, one of the emperors was wearing a crown, and that's why they called the poet laureate laurel from the word laurel. And the, the word laureate, originally really the word from laurel. The poet laureate is a well-known modern example of such prize winner, dating from the easily Renaissance in Italy. According to the myth, again, we say the reason for this uh, was simply and solely because Apollo fell in love with the daughter of Peneus, and most artistic de depiction of the myth focus on the moments of Daphne's transformation into a laurel tree or a tree of laurel. And here, of course, this example, uh, the, the poem I gave you is this moment of transformation. The best poet to have retold the Greek story or the Greek myth was the Roman poet Ovid here in Metamorphosis. The archaic pursuit of a local nymph by an Olympian god Apollo has had it's strange religious cult in Greek culture. You know, again and again, please read this, because here really I give um, a little bit of uh, an elaboration. And I, again, I copied, there are a lot of references about this. Please read that, because it's lovely, really. And look here, more images. You can find many, many images. I chose for you these images here. Here, how Daphne became, um, you, you can see my screen, correct? No, Doctor, we can't. Oh, 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 um, I forgot to share with you. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I was reading here, Daphne, giving you the, 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 the ideas, and I think now you can see. Look here, the images I copied uh, from the net. Many, many images, according to um, the stories as you can see here, the moment of transformation, as you can see, Apollo and Daphne, Apollo and Daphne, as you can see that, okay? So really, it's a lovely, amazing, fantastic, completely fantastic story. Uh, you know, there are, in reality, there's nothing, there's nothing like that. I mean, nobody can change into a tree or something. Anyway, I will stop here and I will continue next time. Boys and girls, I will continue with this next time. So um, next week, we'll have the test, as I said. Uh, next time, I will give the lecture as usual. Okay? 
Okay, okay. Sir, thank you. Saida is asking, is this poem included in the test? Which one? Daphne, you mean? No, no, Ovid is not included. Ovid, Ovid is not included. Saida, Ovid is not included. And Saida, I saw your email and I will respond to you. I will write back to your email. Okay, any question, uh, boys and girls, or one boy and, and, and girls, okay? 